Hey, welcome to NASA Launchpads. I'm your host, Vince Whitfield. What's cooler than being cool? Ice cold, right? But what's cooler than that? Well, once we get down into the really cold temperatures, below negative 150 degrees Celsius, which is negative 238 Fahrenheit, or 123 Kelvin, we're talking about cryogenics. Now, most of you, when you hear about cryogenics, you're probably thinking about science fiction movies where they freeze people and they wake up hundreds of years in the future. Why doesn't NASA use that kind of technology for sending astronauts on long-term spaceflight travel to distant galaxies? Well, here's Rob Boyle, aerospace engineer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, with a reality check. Probably one of the most common ways that, that we hear about cryogenics in, in popular culture is with freezing somebody. Um, the, the, the cryonics kind of technique of uh, popping Ted Williams in a vat of liquid nitrogen and hoping that someday we can understand how to revive him again. The, the, the technique is uh, so conceptual that it's something that, that NASA isn't really pursuing. Uh, we don't understand at all how to wake somebody back up from a, a state like that. And while it makes really good science fiction movies, isn't likely to be part of an actual space flight anytime soon. But Rob does work with cryogenics at NASA. How? Well, let's let him explain. Well, there's actually uh, two different ways that, uh, two main ways that NASA uses cryogenics. One would be for the uh, propulsion and, and power storage um, that you would see in the, the space shuttle, for instance. Um, a lot of the fuels that are used for, for high energy rockets are cryogenic fuels, uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, sometimes methane. And so that the big flashy stuff is associated with rocketry. And then a lot of what we do here at Goddard and uh, at JPL and at, at Ames um, is using cryogenics for science. Um, we find that there are a lot of physical effects that take place at low temperatures um, that enable us to do types of science that can't be done at, at normal room temperature conditions. Wait a minute. Let's focus on that first way that NASA uses cryogenics, propulsion and power storage. Looking at NASA's workhorse manned spaceflight program for the last few decades, the Space Transportation System, more commonly known as the Space Shuttle, how do cryogenics come into play? The biggest, most uh, visible application is storage of uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Most of the, the volume that you see in the, uh, the external tank on the shuttle is liquid hydrogen, maybe 25 degrees above absolute zero, 25 Kelvin and uh, combined with liquid oxygen produces a, a very high energy, very powerful rocket engine that it, in that case it enables us to get uh, a lot of hardware up into low Earth orbit. So, is NASA's cryogenics department only housed at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center? Hardly. Cryogenics are agency-wide at NASA. Both NASA Goddard and NASA JPL have large cryogenics groups that are developing Earth science and space science instruments. The guys at Marshall Space Flight Center and at Glenn have a focus that's mostly on propulsion, either the, the engines or the, the storage of the propellants. And so they tend to have big test facilities that are they're tied into the, 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 the big rocket engines, the big storage tanks that we use. Um, at Stennis Space Center, they have huge test stands with big tanks of liquid oxygen, liquid, liquid hydrogen, they were originally testing the, uh, the Apollo engines. They're now gearing up to test the, uh, the engines that'll be used on the, the new Ares launch vehicles. Uh, Case Kennedy Space Center has huge facilities for supporting the, the launch of these vehicles, big uh, storage tanks of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and they, they manage a fleet of trucks that just pours onto the center in preparation for each of the launch events. It's a worldview that goes from the very, very big to uh, very, very small. The, the little systems that we work on here might be something that you could you know, set on top of your desk and uh, contrast with that with some of the guys that I work with that uh, have these big things that just dwarf the room. I know what you're thinking. So NASA uses lots of cryogenic work in their rockets. Big deal. How does it affect you or me or anybody back here on Earth? The answer might be closer than you realize. Well, actually, one of the applications of cryogenics that, that might become a bit more common is transportation. We actually had uh, some guys from BMW here over the last winter. They've got actually some of their 7 Series cars modified to run on liquid hydrogen. And in the, the trunk was a storage tank of liquid hydrogen. It was a very effective way for them to store and transport a fuel that, that gives very clean transportation technology and uh, enables them to uh, to handle it in a way that's not exactly 
like a standard gasoline filling station, but comes closer to that than the, the high pressure hydrogen storage that we uh, typically see with um, transport vehicles right now. So it's very possible that we'll wind up with something like a, a liquid hydrogen filling station, not necessarily in every street corner, but at least in some of our neighborhoods. There you go, just another example of NASA know-how having an impact on life here on Earth. That's it for now, thanks for watching NASA Launchpad. I'm Vince Whitfield and I'll catch you next time.